So are you looking for insights into lager yeast pitching, pitch rates, and maybe even lager yeast management? Well, I ask that very question to Vine Stefaner and Sierra Nevada's brewmasters, and their recommendations were so insightful. Be sure to watch till the very end because there's a tip there regarding spunding or a bunging pressure and its effect on yeast. We have the 3470. This is the, the common one for the lager beers, and we have yeast propagator, two yeast propagator in our brewery, one yeast pitching tank and two yeast cropping tanks. So we have to, we try to exchange the yeast or take new cells from the university every three months and then start from the very beginning. So from a small Carlsberg Holden to a, a bigger vessel and then just propagate it very properly. We control it. We measure the viability. We measure the yeast cells. We measure the, the dead cells and when it's enough for us from experience, when we know this is the best taste for us, then we pitch the yeast and then we crop it. We crop it normally eight to 10 times, depends on the brewing schedule or on the season, of course, but not longer. I think it takes some generations to have the best power of the yeast. So maybe a generation five, then it's adopted to the word and it has more power and it's faster in, in fermentation but still with good results but when it comes to generation 10 this goes down that sales going up you need more yeast to have the same fermentation speed and fermentation result so that's why we control it every time every week we measure our yeast and control that because this is key this is the best and importance worker in the brewery is the yeast it's a they're living cells and we handle them with care because that is key. I know it's not so easy if you have uh, just the op um, option to take dry yeast if you're a home brewer, but then I can, as I said, it's the adoption is very important. So one of the most um, common things the home brewers are doing, they put the dry yeast directly into the fermenter, from the bag into the fermenter, because this is the instruction. But I would suggest to take something from the mash or something from the first word. Okay, it's higher in, 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 in sugar, but you can dilute it with, with water and then put the yeast inside at the temperature when you want to pitch the yeast. So the yeast is jumping into this sugar. It's getting a little bit adopted to the word, knows the sugar, says hello <laughs> and everything else. And then you can you can uh, pitch a liquid yeast, which is a little bit more, not so shocked if it's going into the, the cold word with hops, because hops is always not so good for, for yeast. And that's why I would suggest that. And we are doing that more or less with our yeast in the propagator. Just give fresh word at the temperature we want to pitch it, let it adapt to the word, to the sugar. They should know each other. It's in every brewery, it's a little bit different, the content of the sugars and everything else. And that's why when the yeast is feeling good, then the yeast will do good work. And it's also a point of temperature. It's a point of pressure. It's a point of oxygen when you will give to the yeast propagation. And this is a big science. And I think it's still not finished to deep, uh, dive deeper into this um, thing. Well, just to simplify the question, besides your Hepaweizen, mm -hmm. do you brew at your brewery, at Vine Stefaner, anything that doesn't use lager yeast besides the Hepaweizen? We have two yeasts, yeah. We have a Hefeweizen yeast and a lager yeast for our lager beers. And they are different. They are different in... Uh, pH, optimum temperature, optimum, and also they're producing different um, side products. So what we want in, uh, in the heavy wise, for example, Easter and all this banana, fruity things, isomil, acetate and everything else, we want it in the heavy wise, but we don't want it in the lager. And you can do a lot of things 
wrong in the lager or with the lager yeast, and you also have this side products you don't want to have typically in a lager. But this is also a point of equipment because a lot of people don't have this equipment or, or a lot of breweries. That's why, yeah, we have it. That's, that's the point when we come to spunding, for example, or to tank size or tank vertical or horizontal tanks. Um, this is also a big influence on the yeast and all the side products they are producing. Scott, Charlie Bamsforth told the story that he toured a brewery and it had loggers and he asked him what the yeast was that they used. And they said they just used their house yeast. And apparently their house yeast was <laughs> not a lager yeast. What's the other side of the coin? Can you brew a good lager without a, a lager yeast? And I would love to open up this Augustiner when you're ready. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, I think it, there's, it's always going to be something people will debate. My, my own personal opinion is that if you say, can you make a good lager with ale yeast, what do, we, what do we mean when you say good? Let's maybe start there. But I think there are some really fundamental differences in the two, two yeast types. And Tobias was talking about flavor um, and aroma uh, compounds that the yeast will produce. Our house ale yeast... For example, I've certainly found a lower limit of fermentation temperature that it it is happy with. And below that, and this is well above typical lager fermentation temperatures, below that, you just get a lot of sulfurs, mostly H2S. And it's very unpleasant. But when you are uh, in the yeast happy range, you get a lot of esters, a whole lot. And it's really quite fruity. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not necessarily in the flavor profile of a Hellas to be full of fruity esters. Can you do it? Yeah, you can do it. But, you know, we have to give a little bit of a, a nod to a style guideline a little bit and flavor profile. Do you know what I mean? You, you won't win a World Beer Cup that way, right? Probably not. That said, you can do some really interesting things with any yeast strain. Tobias, you were talking about the influence of pressure or uh, the influence of temperature. You can find the range at which any given strain will be able to ferment in a healthy way. Beyond the high and the low of that range, you're going to find that the yeast gets really stressed and it does things that you really won't be happy with. You'll end up with a lot of off flavors. Most of them are, are not. And the same thing can be said with applying a lot of pressure too early in the fermentation. That can be a problem as well. For example, in Hefeweizen, with the open fermenters, it's pretty typical that the depth of the liquid in these tanks is not greater than the width of the tank, but one-to-one. -one. And that is because you really want the, the yeast to be able to do the primary fermentation in the absence of any excess pressure. And on the other hand, other strains, you can suppress certain off-flavor formation by applying a little bit of pressure. And so it, it really, to echo Tobias what you said, the yeast makes the beer. We don't make beer, the yeast makes the beer. And you have to do everything you can to find out what you what you have to do with any given strain of yeast to get the result that that you're looking for and keep the yeast healthy that's yeah. the the main thing and how to treat the yeast because this yeah you can use the same strain in different breweries and have different results of course mm -hmm. so that's why we found our way of yeast management or yeast handling to have the taste we want to have also for different uh, styles of beers and yeah, one, one big point, for example, is the pressure. So I am I think, as Scott said, what is good and what is not good, and do, is it award-winning or not? As For me, the first point is not to uh, win an award. It's, it's nice. Yeah, of course, it's nice to win an award because somebody appreciates that. But I think my, my key or the key in mind, Stefan, is we want to have a, a, a balanced beer. We, this is the, the main key. Is it on the rough side or on the very slim side or smooth side? But it has to be balanced in total. And it has to be inside of the, the style category and the tradition of the Bavarian breweries because this is what the customer expects. They When they open up when Stefan and Helles, they expect something else than they expect from a, 
a home brewer from the United States. It's not, I don't want to say this is better or this is worse. This is a different taste and, and different from what you expect. And that's why we have to focus on this is what our way of brewing that we've been inside the style category representing the Bavarian, Bavarian tradition and have a very balanced, high drinkable beer in all the different types. And that's why for us, diacetyl esters are not good in lagers. They're perfect. Diacetyl is nowhere perfect. So there are beer styles that the people um, accept it or like it, but it's not in a Bavarian lager and it's not in a Bavarian wheat. And as Scott said, the Easter, for example, if you do it in the wheat beers, we have a, a, a horizontal tank that is very low. So we have no pressure at all, on, not on the liquid side and not on the tank side. Then when you have no pressure, you get a lot of Easters. Also with the special yeast we have. In the, for the bottom fermenting, for the lager beers, we use the vertical tanks, very high, 50 meters, 18 meters high. And we even set a little bit pressure on it. So not pressure, it's spunding, but we, because the higher the pressure, the lower the, the Easter potential or Easter production. And, but as Scott said, the point is when to start spunding. So we have, of course, we have pressure from the liquid side, but we don't want to give extra pressure with just for spunding. So that's why we start very late in fermentation process. So when, more or less when the, the diacetyl is on the high peak, then we start spunding. Because this is also typically the, when the extract is one or two percent above the final extract. And then it's the, the best point to start spunding and it's the best point to setting pressure on it to reduce also the Easters or not um, letting grow more. Yeah, good point, Tobias. Typically here in the US, we use bunging as the uh, equivalent term for spunding, meaning you have closed the vent valve down so that the tank can build pressure by the yeast. But once you, the tank top, the head pressure reaches the level that you have set the valve for, it will bleed off the excess pressure beyond that set point. And we're doing the same thing on ales as well as lagers, by the way, Tobias, this, you've been here before, but we, we bung the tank. You can make a calculation. It's not that hard to do. So yeah. if you know what your final gravity is going to be on your beer, and you know this because you've done a forced accelerated fermentation on that beer in the lab, and so you have a number. Then you can say, at what gravity before terminal can I bung the tank and to what pressure should I bung that tank to so that at the end of fermentation, I have reached my target carbonation level or whatever that is. And that's an easy calculation. And we try and do that at the last possible second because that way you have less chance for off flavors because you've put a stress on the yeast. Yeah, that's right. As I said, it's a living, living culture. It's the important uh, worker in the, in the brewery and yeast makes the beer. So no pressure on the yeast because we also don't like a big pressure. So we work different when we have pressure. So it's the same with the yeast. So let the yeast chill in the tank, adapt it to the word, handle it with care. Then it will get the, the best results, in my opinion. Now, this was just one clip from the entire replay, and I've posted the replay link here on the screen and in the description. And don't forget to leave me a comment and let me know what your top takeaway was. A like is always appreciated, too.